and I invite you, any of you to uh, interrupt me at any time and we can go off on a question hunt. Um, I invite you any time to give feedback. It's difficult obviously in the electronic environment because there's a, you kind of are speaking into a void. So any feedback is gratefully appreciated. So I'd like to start off with this idea that that all it's all in the mind really and uh, the way we understand the world, the way we uh, experience the world has got a lot to do with the language we use, uh, the words we use, the metaphors we use, the stories we think about, the stories which we tell, the stories that we expose ourselves to are very important in our lives and in fact some people even say that storytelling is the basis of all experience. Uh, for instance, you, it's said by some that you can't have an experience unless you have the words to describe the experience. So when I ask Holger, what was your last holiday like or what was your last trip to Ethiopia like, uh, if he didn't have, it, when he describes his experience, that's actually when the experience is occurring. That's when it's actually happening. That's when you're having a holiday or a, or, or a, or a happy childhood or wherever, when you think about it and when you talk about it. So other problem or issue with life is that it's, it's, it's highly complex and one of the ideas is that in order to describe something, uh, you need a, a metaphor a way of talking about something so that you can understand it. You can't describe water in the smoothness of a, um, of a table in terms of the smoothness of a table. You need to compare it to something else. So, for example, you could compare the table which you're sitting at um, being as smooth as the surface of a lake on a moonlit night. And that might make it more understandable and more available to you. So, what I'd like to suggest is that that at the core of all our experience is, is actually a game which we're playing and each one of us are playing a number of different games and understanding that and understanding how the game actually works gives you amazing ability to be able to step outside of the game which is really important because you can't change the game when you're busy playing it you need to find some kind of a way of stepping outside of it taking an overview of it and then stepping back into the game and then being able to affect the necessary changes. Now each of us play, I'd, I'd reckon around 35, 40, 50 games simultaneously. For example you might see uh, your relationship with another, with a significant other as a game. Uh, you might see the economy as a game, you might see war as a game, you might see education as a game, medicine, psychology, archaeology, even change management are all able to be decoded in terms of a game. So it's a very powerful metaphor because it helps you understand human interrelationships and interactions in ways which seeing them as they are would be very, very difficult to decode without having such a model. So today's presentation will really be about something about memory and how memory is formed in terms of how you relate to the game, the culture, yourself and how that memory can be changed and when you start thinking about something differently uh, what did Castaneda say? You don't change, you just change your way of looking, that's all. And looking has a lot to do with use of language. Um, there's a story uh, about in the South Sea, uh, uh, somewhere I think in, in, in Indonesia uh, they had these cargo cults uh, once upon a time and they would see the airplanes flying overhead and believe that these were gods from the uh, from another world. And when the first archaeologists, um, anthropologists, uh, missionaries came, um, one of the things they did when they made contact, first contact with these tribal groups, was to show them pictures of things which existed in the West, things like um, traffic lights, things like uh, uh, post boxes, things like airplanes, things like and the interesting thing is after having shown those photographs and asked uh, they, the people they showed the photographs to didn't even see those objects on the um, on the photograph because they had no language for it, they had no words for it. So you can see the extent to which language is deeply tied into into experience. So changing the words, changing the language, changing the stories has got a lot to do with experience and can be used as a tool in change management. In fact, I think it is the primary tool 
of change management. Stories and language, symbols, metaphors, these things are the basis on, on which the work of change management is based. Also, part of change management is involved with uh, uh, motivating groups of people. And uh, groups of people, um, you know, we have this pyramidical structure which we've, uh, the Roman army, I think, inherited from the Egyptians who got it from who knows where. And that kind of represents many of the ways, in w the, the primary way in which we design our organizations. We have a pyramidical structure. If you go to Microsoft Organization Chart Wizard, you'll see that there's only one way to design an organization, and that's in the uh, that's based on a me metaphor or a model of a pyramid. You have the alpha predator on the top, and you have the rest of the structure going downwards, and that represents the organization as we are familiar with today. Uh, there are other variations on that. There's network organizations and star-centric organizations and things like that. But you know, ultimately, the, the model which is used, especially in large corporations where we're expected to work and so-called effect change, um, uh, are those pyramidical type structures that you have uh, some alpha predator or alpha male or alpha female, if, if you like, at the top of the organization. And everything is designed around that. So it shows a vertical hierarchy with and, and, and the conclusion that people draw from this is that somehow whoever is perching right at the top of the pyramid is the most important individual. And that's not the case. That's very much different to how it's seen in many African cultures. And in many African cultures, it's seen the whole organization, the whole village, the whole tribe may be seen as a system where every aspect of it is it's equally important as every other aspect. So there may be a chief, there may be a, 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 a traditional healer, there may be all of a, a, a seer, a, a, a sanusi they call them in South Africa, a prophet. All of those are e considered to be equally important because they can't exist without the other. So that's the kind of background I draw to this. And uh, I'd like first of all to ask if there are any, any questions after that brief introduction. Is there any, any feedback or any input there before we start the presentation? And there goes Holger. Sorry, I have a little bit a problem with the technology. Sure. My iPad in the moment doesn't work, and the microphone does also not work. So I would just ask for the moment the participants to raise questions to Stephen. If you don't hear them, then um, I will translate them to you. I will. So. Sure. Okay. Any questions? <laughs> Lots of staring faces, Steve. Good, good. That's the beginning. That's they've been blown away then, <laughs> or they haven't understood. <laughs> well, maybe, <laughs> or maybe okay. they're just tired because we had a party yesterday. Oh really? Oh wow. Okay, great. <laughs> okay then, Holger. Then should we continue with the present? Sorry. Yeah. Um, no, I was just thinking again. We did another logical mistake this morning because if I show now the presentation, it will mm -hmm. only be shown uh, if somebody here in the room talks. So you should share your you should share your um, desktop as we said. Before. Should I do yeah. that? Okay. Let me share your desktop. Okay. Let me do that over here. I'll go up to share screen share and hold on. I just. Share. It works. All right. Holger, do you catch that? Do you copy that? Yeah, it's okay. It's good. Yeah. All right. Okay. All right. Fantastic. So, there's a. If I can begin with it. Sorry. 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 Starting in. Okay. There's some. Olga, shall I continue? Yes. Okay, sorry about that. There's some strange echoes in the background over there. 
All right, so <coughs> this... Hang on a second. I'm going to go back to headphones over here because I'm getting a lot of echo from the background there. No, what I need to do, Steve, no, no, it's okay. What I need to do is to mute uh, my microphone here. Okay. All right, because I'm getting a lot of feedback from the back over there. Okay, let me just go back to the the change days. All right, fantastic. So I see you've got it up on the wall over there. All right, so the technology we're going to talk about has got an African name. Um, it's called an Isivivane. And the name of this really means, in Zulu, it means to put your stone upon the pile. It basically means to get people together to make a common commitment and to uh, be able to talk about their shared aspiration, their shared vision, their shared purpose for the future, and to be able to concretize that or to make that visible and manifest by arranging stones in relationship to uh, each other. So that's really the idea of Isi Vivani. And Isi Vivani has always been used for, well, as far as we can tell, there's stone circles in Africa which date back tens, if not hundreds of thousands of years. Um, we understand that the world then is similar to what it is today in a way because somehow when some big project or some big th big thing needed to be started uh, people had to be engaged people had to commit their time their energy their effort into this shared purpose or shared aspiration so the Isivivani was a tool to be able to discuss what needed to happen what discuss what needed to change and to allow individuals to understand or relate to the different aspects of that wheel and to be able to engage that in terms of a public performance. So what we know in modern learning theory is that whole, whole body learning where you use the entirety of your body is much more effective than just sitting around a conference table and talking about something and agreeing because you're only sitting here and you're only using an aspect of your mind. You're not using your entirety. And one of the problems with that approach, the traditional approach, is that after the workshop, after the conference, many people go back to work and a couple of days later they don't even remember that they were at a conference. So it's important when one engages this kind of event, this kind of transformative event, what it actually means is you step outside of the day-to-day -day things that people do and you step into a ritual space. Now the importance of a ritual is that it, it actually suspends the rational mind. You have a way of processing the world and understanding the world but this takes you into a zone of the, the, the myth, the, myth the, uh, uh, the story, the, uh, the way of seeing something from an allegorical point of view, not seeing something as it really is but seeing it in terms of something else and what I've come to understand about this work is that every single individual you speak to in an organization has got a shared view of what's going on which is shared with the people they work with and the people they relate to and also there's a very deeply personal understanding of what's going on that's your own personal Weltanschauung yeah I think they say in German your own your way of viewing the world and a lot of interesting things can happen when people start to reveal the way they see the organization and the way they see themselves. So these are the kind of things which we do in facilitation. We ask people, um, how do you see this uh, organization? If this organization were an animal, zum Beispiel, what kind of an animal would it be? Uh, if this animal were a kind of a vehicle, what kind of vehicle would it be? And you can ask these questions from people and they if they start to come up with similar metaphors, similar ways of describing the organization, you know that you've hit on a gold mine because somewhere there is sitting an allegorical story, a story that you can use which everyone can understand and see their part in. So that's the, that's the kind of way which we work this. We uh, basically perform a ritual. We take people out of their normal day-to-day -day experience. We create a ritual where people can kick back, chill a little bit, uh, have fun, laugh, particularly laugh. Is, laughter is very, very important in change management. When you, when you hear people laughing, you know that there's a breakthrough there. 
you know, because people tend to be very, very serious, especially in big multinational corporations. We do quite a lot of work for them, and they're very, very uh, uh, full of themselves. They're very important, you know. We've done work for some quite large organizations, and uh, the funny thing is that many people who work and live in those organizations are terrifically timid and very uh, feared to show a little bit about themselves and about what they truly are. Um, so we, 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 tr we break through those barriers and we try and find a way where we can connect with each other as human beings, not uh, uh, titles in a virtual uh, matrix of control, but as individuals of where we come from. We've all got stories. We know we've got ideas of where we come from. We've got a kind of an idea of where we're going we've got a kind of an idea of where we are now. So it's just sharing those stories and, and finding a way to connect all those stories, weave them together, and set off this thing, the structure which we're going to create, and make sure that it helps us go into the future with a sense of hope. And I think that's the best people can achieve. In Nigeria, there's a proverb that uh, hope, is the, hope is the pillar of the world. You know, hope is what... Um, holds up the world. You know, we all are expecting something, we're hopeful about something, and if we aren't hopeful about stuff which is going to happen in the future, then that's got very much of the characteristics of a poverty nar narrative. You know, when a story doesn't stretch far into the future. So I'd like you to just think for a moment, how far, does you, how far into the future does your personal story go? You know, is it a couple of days? Is it a couple of weeks? A couple of months? You know, where? If, how far? If, yes. Hold on. Can I can I just stop you for a moment? I think. Yeah, yes. You, you just uh, posed a wonderful question, and I, I'll ask you to to rephrase that again in a moment. To ask it again, and I think I would like to break the participants here into groups for five sure. minutes. First of all, sure. to think about the question, and then then uh, talk about the question. Absolutely. I think that would be would be really great to to get this a little bit more interactive. Yeah. Sure. No, absolutely happy with that. Yeah. Cool. So please please uh, pose your question again. All right. Well, let's make it a two part question. Um, how far into the future does your personal story extend? And tell a couple of words about an event that you're looking forward to experiencing in the future. Okay, let me just repeat the two questions. How far into the future does your personal story extend? Yep. And sorry, the second one was... Um, you you got to tell a couple of words about an event which you're looking forward to in the future. In the future, okay. I'd say... Um, an event you're looking forward into the future. I'd say give everybody like uh, 30 or uh, one minute time to reflect for themselves and then we break, we break them into groups of, of three. Cool. Very good. Okay. Right. I'll, I'll mute you for a moment but you will cool. observe what you will observe what's going on uh, or you mute yourself. Mute yourself and you can see what's how happening. How do I mute myself? How do I mute? Oh wait, hang on a second. Here we go. I can mute myself over here. Okay. Good. Can I? Okay. Please break into groups of three. Please change place.
very much the work so let them work a bit meanwhile I show you the work of our fantastic graphical facilitators I hope you're seeing that now but I assume you can see it so we have like 20 now 10 10 uh, charts here We are like 140 people internationally. We have also people from Africa, and it has been a great event. Um, I hope you're hearing me now. Can you can you um, stop the screen sharing for a moment that I can see your face? Let me show me that you. you can Yes, I can. Yay. Okay, Mr. Switch the camera back on. Yes. Can you hear me, Steve? Yes, I can. Do you enjoy what's happening in the moment? It's amazing. I can hear people laughing and giggling. Yeah, and I just, uh, I just said somebody, somebody just said. Um, she was thinking of whether she should stay here or not in the room, and I saw somebody already leaving, and I think yeah. this is exactly what needs to happen. So let's improvise, yeah. let's dance a little bit, you and I. Absolutely. Yeah? Sure. You should Absolutely. talk for more than five or ten minutes, and then we yes. should, should again break a bit. But All right. But now it's working. It's okay, great. fantastic. Great question. So please stay online, yeah? 
Yeah, sure, here I am. <laughs> Great, good, good. And you can look a little bit more at our, our wonderful posters. Yes, I'm seeing it. It's brilliant. It's good, huh? Yes, cool, fantastic. <laughs> yeah. I can see your finger. Stay. Yeah, I know. It's okay. a little bit difficult to hold that. Hello, hello to Peggy. In fact, what I do, I'll change the camera. There's a different camera. Who's that? That's Steve from South Africa. So I think. <laughs> I think that's better. Okay. Are you still there, Steve? Yes, I am. Okay, cool. Okay. How much time do you want, folks? Three, four minutes? Yeah, take all the time you need. Yesterday we had a big award here in GIZ. We, we do a award together with GIZ. It's called the Change mm -hmm. Leadership Award. So, for example, this lady from Indonesia, this guy from India, this mm -hmm. guy here from the Philippines, there are three of the six awardees yesterday. So, we had a big celebration. Wow, that's great. That's yeah, great. Yeah. It looks like a real, a really nice crowd you have. How many people are yeah. there? About 140. 140? Yes. Okay. Well, we then. Have six, okay. We have six workshops in parallel. Okay, all right. Uh, I want you really to come one time next year, maybe. <laughs> next year, next year, next year, and I'll take you to lunch. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I'll take you to lunch. Okay, hey, that's, that's work. That's working very well. So I'll, I'll, um, hmm. I think I'll stop them in a moment. Also, also notice, you know, when they're talking about it, uh, how how they how they express their, you know, you were speaking to a lady that uh, he was talking about the future, and she was putting her hands in front of her and sort of like showing, literally, like she was showing a timeline on her hands, you know, from past yeah. to future and stuff like that. So often, yeah. what we do is we get people to draw it on a timeline, um, and that that's quite powerful because just talking about it is one thing, but Putting it down on paper and drawing it as a type timeline is is, is is quite incredible for some people because most people have not done this before in their lives. Okay. Unfortunately, our graphical had I known that our graphical recorders are not in the room in the moment. Okay. Which is really a pity. Mm -hmm. um, probably they didn't expect that it's so process oriented because then they could mm -hmm. draw it. But shall I ask somebody to to do that at the on a flip chart? If you wish. If you wish, it's completely uh, yeah. You can take a you know, the the exercise is is just draw draw a line and mark on the line where you are and mark uh, mark on the line uh, uh, what what's waiting for you in the future. Well, yeah. I'd, I'd say I'll, I'll put you on the microphone and you can facilitate that. Um, so just a second, yeah. Okay. So I'll I'll uh, uh, please stop the screen sharing now for a moment. If you okay. Wish. We will want to see your face. Okay, right. There we go. Okay, so I'll and unmute your unmute your um, your mic. Unmute my mic. My mic isn't yeah, un unmuted. Unmute, isn't it? unmute, unmute. So that we can hear you again. We can't hear you yet. Okay, oh, no, can you hear me? You? Sorry, your microphone was unmuted. Excuse me. Yes, it was. <laughs> Speakers here. Okay, folks, can I stop you, please? Hello. <laughs> I know, I know. Very intense. Steve, these folks are having very intense discussions. I think then let them have intensive discussions. It's important. If. <laughs> No, it's not. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, don't worry. Okay, Steve, say, say it again. All right. Okay, this, this. Hold on a second. There's a bit of feedback over there. Can you hear me, Holger? Okay, I can hear myself. Uh, I've got an echo in the background. So, um, 
what we do with this exercise about talking about your past and your future and your present, it's very important because this is actually an aspect of your own personal operating system. Um, in other words, the way you talk about yourself has got a lot to do with your experience in the world. So it depends on what story you're telling, who you're telling it to, how you're telling it to, to them, and how convinced you look as a result of telling that story. Do you feel good about telling the story? And if you don't feel 100% about it, you can always work on the story and embellish it and make it more interesting, perhaps, and even to yourself. You know? So how do you think about yourself? How do you talk about yourself? These are all very, very important because they don't just describe your world and who you are. They literally create it. So when you start changing these stories, and this, the amazing thing about this thing is that it works in the same as a, at a level of the individual, at the level of the team or the family or the small group and at the level of the organization. If you don't have a story which is motivating you to go into the future, in systems theory they call it the strange attractor, something which is pulling you into the future. If you don't have that story, you have a problem. And one of the characteristics of people who are so-called uh, poor people or disempowered people, as they're called in South Africa, is that their story only goes a couple of days into the future. It's uh, and the narrative is something like, where can I get 20 rand today so I can buy a two-liter bottle of coke and a slice of uh, and 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 some uh, sliced white bread because that's going to maintain me for two days. Can you imagine having a story like that and how you would feel as a result of telling that story? And that's a very very common story over here. But those stories can be changed. They can be altered. So think about this in terms of your own story. Uh, the exercise which we give often to people is to draw a horizontal line, you know, line like this. And that line um, is a continuum. At the beginning of that line is your birth, and at the end of, your, uh, that, of that line is your death. And you need to make a letter X where you think you are on that line. And then just talk about those events and maybe write down some of those events which have characterized your life from birth until now. What are the high points, low points if you prefer as well? Uh, and then what are you looking for, forward to in the future? Um, this is very, very interesting because it's got a lot to do also with your position of power. And uh, I, I really encourage you to do that as ongoing homework for yourself. Just play around with the timeline and see how you feel about the events which you're looking forward to. So maybe that's something to, to play with a little bit later on. So question, uh, when you were talking about that story, uh, about sharing that story about an event which you're looking forward to at some point in the future, how, how did you uh, think about, how did you, how did you feel about that? What was the feelings which that encouraged? Did that encourage a sense of excitement or fear or trepidation? Or how do you feel about your own story? Because ultimately, that's the thing we have. Sorry. Sorry. I'll mute my mic then. OK, mute your mic for a moment. Yeah. So I, I want to he hear a couple of, couple of voices. Uh, can you hear us, Steve? Then raise your thumb, please. Very good. So how do you feel about your story? How did that exercise go? How did you feel about the sharing? Arun, let me come closer. This is Arun from India, one of our hey, RODs, I, I just told you. Uh, this exercise we just did? Yes. I realized that uh, the vision that I had about what my story should look like, it, it can be described in words. I always used to feel something very vague and ambiguous in the, at the back of my head. But while I was narrating it, I realized that it's something solid. And I can plan for it. I, I have a definite time frame that I, can, I want to look into it. I mean, it goes to the end, so I'm not saying how or when I want to go off. But yeah, I, I have some uh, steps leading to it that I realized. Thank you. Anybody else wants to say something? Another LOD. 
I can share some. Annette, um, this is Annette. Yeah, I realize that my story uh, is challenging my normal locus of control sort of feeling because it's different than most of my other stories. But that is a very relevant story for me now, so I'm kind of coming to grips with that. Uh, and while we were discussing, I said this is so different, and it felt like it was so different, but now what's sinking in is that a lot of things are in fact not so different from everything that I've ever experienced. So it's kind of slowly becoming a little bit more realistic. Mm -hmm. Sorry, what's Karen. your name? Karen. Uh, for us, uh, the difficulty was to define the story because we said the past has shown that uh, it's difficult to, to know ahead of time what's going to happen. So uh, you might have goals, but they should, shouldn't be automatically goals like I want to buy a car in two years' time or I want to have that client in five years' time, but rather about making sure that you continue to follow your values. Okay. Let me let me use it. Oh, there's more. There's. I think. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's you. Yeah, it's me, exactly. Uh, <laughs> why not me? Okay, okay that's you. Yeah. Uh, well, my story, I, uh, I feel excited. Let's not mute. No, no, it's okay. Okay. I feel excited telling my story and uh, happy because my main agenda in life is uh, simply to live life as long as I can and uh, take things uh, happily. There are two cartoon characters that really come to my mind very clearly. Mm -hmm. uh, this is uh, Pumba of um, uh, Lion King, yeah. and then the turtle in uh, Finding Nemo, I think the name is. <laughs> when he was asked, uh, how old are you? And he says, 150, and still young, and he said it happily. <laughs> and, uh, I like that. So uh, that's, uh, that's how I view my uh, life and uh, future. Thank you. OK, so now I have to mute here and you have to unmute. Just a second. Mute. Unmute. Oops. Unmute. Are you there, Holger? Yeah, we, we just said now it's your turn to react. Obviously, you've heard right. everything, is it? Yes, yes, I have. I heard everything. It was interesting about that one about uh, uh, living long. You know, there's certain themes which come come up in people's lives, and it's really interesting about that one because it 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 it, it talks about power. You know, longevity, seeing far into the future, uh, is a hallmark of a powerful story, and uh, people who don't. Uh, Whoops, I'm getting feedback. Is it my mic? Holger, did you hear that? There was a big echoing sound over there. Is that better now? Can you hear me? Holger? Yeah, yeah, it's okay. We experiment. It's all on my side. So don't worry. If oh, something okay. like that happens, I'll, I'll make it stop in a minute. Okay. All right. Fantastic. All right. So you know, certain themes come up in people's stories. That uh, and and one particularly has to do with time. The further into the future your story extends, uh, that has got to do with your personal power. Uh, we have this idea. You know, many people in South Africa, as I say, they wake up not knowing where they're going to get food for the day, and that becomes the predominant narrative. The narrative of suffering, and the narrative of suffering is also accompanied by 
certain gestures, certain uh, words, certain language, certain use of words and language and the way they interact with people. Uh, this is, uh, I can guarantee you that if anyone were to adopt that narrative style, they would feel poor. So a lot of our work is, is, is trying to get people to reflect upon their own stories. Step and, 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 and I think one of the key skills of reflecting on your story is to be able to step outside of it. And it's a very shamanic approach that. You can't change it when you're inside it. So you need to find a way of being able to step out of the story, view the story from another perspective, make the necessary changes. And, and I'm talking about the changes as being kind of indirectly. You know, what do I want my story to be going forward? Do I want to be more of a hare than a turtle? Do I want to? Uh, do I want to have more fun? Do I want to travel? Do I, you know, all of the kind of things which you want to engage. How do you put that together into a complex narrative? The characteristic of which is that it should make you feel enthused. You should feel good about your story to the extent that you are happy to share it, and that uh, and you start to engage people in that way as well because it's like uh, finding out about that story. You know, a lot of people when they talk to you, they let on a little bit about their position in the social hierarchy. Like uh, I remember a while back, a a woman telling me uh, something like, "As I was saying to our winemaker the other week." Now that narrow, just that little phrase betrays so much about what that individual thinks of herself in terms of a position of power and stuff like that. So think about those things which you put into your, into your story and how people converse about themselves and how you also talk about yourself if somebody asks you a question. So it's a tremendously interesting idea uh, area for change management because ultimately organizations as well as individuals have stories. Um, there is a sense of, of past, peasant, present and future. Uh, sorry, peasant was a, a, a Freudian slip but maybe that's also past, peasant, present and future. And uh, that future has got to be able to be compelling to us. You've got to feel good about when you think about that story. Otherwise, why are you spending time and energy and effort with the organization if it doesn't have a story that motivates you and excites you and entrances you and stuff like that? Now, a lot of people talk about leadership and storytelling and how it's important to be a really good storyteller when you deliver the message. And, and I, I really encourage all of you to, to start thinking about the skills of story that you do have already and finding ways to embellish them. Because as I said earlier, the story is very much akin to an operating system on a computer. If you don't have an operating system on your computer, your computer doesn't work. It simply doesn't happen. So you've got to be able to create a compelling, interesting operating system, which you can, while it's running, pause, reprogram, and carry on with it. You don't have to have a complete reboot when you do this. So all of this basically rests on your selection of, of, of a metaphor for yourself. How do, you, how do you see yourself? What story, is there an archetypal story out there which describes what it is you are and what you do? Um, the story I use for myself is a, uh, something called a cocopelli. Um, you can see in the presentation on the first page over there's a kind of a stylized picture of it. If in case you don't know what a cocopelli is, uh, it's mentioned in a lot of myth and legend, particularly from North America, uh, northern Russia, and they had carvings of these, uh, these individuals. And it shows somebody who's a little bit hunched up, he's got a bag on his back, and he's carrying a flute, playing a flute. And Steve? Yes? Can I stop you again for a moment? Sure. Um, first of all, you, I wanted to show that slide. Which one was that? Tell me, please. It's number... You talked about one slide in the presentation, isn't it? The very first one. That's it. That's, it. that's the one. That's the one. That's, that's the uh, what I'm talking about. Okay. So... I'm getting feedback here. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And there was a question in the room. Sure, please. What is it? Steve, uh, my name is Daddy. I want to ask you about telling the story because when 
in a period of change, we sometimes want the organization or the leaders to change the story, to change the metaphor. And it is from a, come from a narrative uh, perspective, narrative set therapy, we are looking together at what we call the unique outcome to create an alternative story, not to establish the, the, the automatic story. Uh, the goal of the change is to create, from my experience, I want to ask you about it, to create the alternative story of the organization. Did you understand, Steve? I, I had difficulty in connecting with that. I'm going to just, just change something here quickly. We can ask Gary to come, come closer to the computer and speak into the computer. I, 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 I would appreciate it, please, if you don't mind. There was a lot of echo on that. Yeah, yeah, I know. I know. Okay. Steve? Yes, I can, I can see you in here. Hi. Cool. I can see you, but uh, I uh, recall your face. Um, uh, I'm coming from a narrative therapy. Yes. Uh, and in narrative therapy, when we are trying to motivate change, we are trying to, to create with our clients uh, an alternative story uh, to help them to, to find a unique outcome and from the unique outcome to, to arrange themselves an alternative story that will give them the opportunity to create a change because if they are staying at their dominant uh, 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 story, they will probably stuck at the same uh, That's right, place. Yes. That's right, yes. So I wonder okay. if you can... Uh, okay. Uh, okay, thank you. So um, I'll, I'll amplify on that. I, I did work years ago, I was a psychologist once upon a time, and we were doing work with people who were addicted to bad drugs, uh, bad drugs as, a, as distinct from good drugs, yeah? Not all drugs are bad and not all good drugs are good. So one of the things which we discovered is that when somebody went through a change program, for instance, like a 12-step program, uh, they would go through the process, they would be free of whatever they wanted to be free of for that time, and then they would go back to the place they came from. Uh, the story had changed, the, uh, uh, they went through the program, they, they went back to the environment which they came from. And oftentimes, very soon when they got back to the environment, they started to engage in the same kind of behaviors. And one of the reasons for this, I think, is that the, nothing, nothing changes in the environment. When you go back to the environment when you came from, which, which you came from, uh, nothing has changed there, so they're all over the place. There are reminders of who you used to be, what you used to do, who you used to do it with, and when, and all the rest of that stuff. So it's very, very easy to, to go back into the old pattern because the memory palace that you occupied has remained unchanged. So it's reminding you continuously of who you are, where you come from. I mean, just think about you're carrying stuff on you right now, which reminds you who you are. There's a driving license somewhere, I'm sure, and there's an ID document somewhere, and a passport, and maybe keys to a house, and maybe keys to a, a car, and maybe uh, something on your iPad. All these serve as continuous reinforcements and reminders to us about the kind of information which reinforces that sense of who we are. So it's not just changing the story, it's literally when somebody finishes with a program like that and they go back, part of the program continues in the environment which says you have to change your environment to suit the person who you now are, which means moving things around. Things which you will remember having moved around because you're using the entirety of your body. So it's not just the story, it's the reminders of who you are and of your new story. And the best way of creating that, in my humble opinion, is to create some kind of artwork. You know, cr make a clay model of yourself. Make a uh, draw yourself. Uh, make a song about yourself. Uh, sing that song in your mind. You can do all of these kind of things. So the story itself is maybe the kind of media which carries all this other form of experience. So I, I don't know if that, that answers your question. It's not just the narrative. Narrative is vitally important. However, your narrative, you need to be reminded of your own narrative by the things you surround yourself, the objects, the, the metaphors, the sounds, the, the, the colors, all of these things are reminders of, of who you are and what 
part of the universe you occupy. So, yeah, I don't know. Did that answer it, kind of? Yes. And Steve, uh, can I introduce yes. another exercise at that point? Sure, sure, please. Yeah, go I, for it. I, I think we are, we are doing nice tango now, isn't it? We're slowly yeah, get, sure. getting into it. Okay. Yes. I want, I want to propose, does everybody who has something to write or to draw, um, if not get a paper from there, I want to propose the following exercise. Think about how the last two days, two and a half days, the world change days, change your story. And they might not have changed your story at all. Of course, we hope with all the facilitation that, that Denise did that it changed your story a bit or a lot. And we hear from some people here already that it changed their story. So think about how that changed your story and make a drawing. Make a drawing about how their story has changed. And once you made a drawing, stand up and, and go around in the room and show it to others. Is that a good exercise, Steve? That sounds super. <laughs> that sounds super. Great. Okay. Make, make a drawing about how, you, how your future has changed the story and then show it to the others. Um, can you, can you uh, mute yourself for a moment, please? Yeah. People are busy drawing. Effects. Artwork going on. Okay. <laughs> but hi now. I think once you're done, please just get up, and then maybe somebody else will get up, and you find. So just go around, do a little bit of a roaming exhibition. Okay. Is somebody really okay? Get it for free. <laughs> he was a, uh, he was important in my life uh, a while ago, and I forgot him. Meanwhile, and then he showed up in the in the entrance of our house. Somebody had a Cocopelli image fixed there, okay. and then it vanished again. Today he showed up again, so oh, now he's with me all the rest of my life. <laughs> So, Steve, you see people are taking that exercise very serious, so, good. <laughs> because um, maybe I can tell you a little bit while they're, while they're drawing. We have a wonderful um, Jamaican-born, Jamaican UK-based uh, facilitator. Her name is Denise Brawler. You'd love her. And she facilitates our learning journey. And uh, she asks a lot of questions about how we change. and. What do we do? And about stories. And she's also very much about storytelling. So, in fact, the whole group is into storytelling very much. <laughs> we can't hear you now, but I think you can hear me, obviously, because you're not in here. Yeah. 
time. Seems that people really want to perfect this, their artwork about their story, which I think is great. Oh, this is a whole storyline coming up here. Danilo, once you're done, just stand up and meet other people and exchange. I'm sure more people will stand up in a moment. <laughs> Anybody else finished? Okay, so the two of you can exchange or go around. Okay. <laughs> the drawing is not because look is there oh, some similarity in yes. what you have drawn question marks and, and the new road <laughs> yes new roads <laughs> opening up <laughs> you have also question marks I have a lot of questions <laughs> <laughs> I came with questions I'm even with all questions I think this really stood out for me the the timeline, because I think when we discussed, I said I, I, I can't think beyond a year because it's so hard to uh, to predict. But what stood out for me is the moving from linear thinking to more circular, circular, circular thinking. Uh, but within that, taking time to to reflect uh, on the actions you're taking and the path uh, that you're taking, but also acting. Or that reflection and not getting stuck mm -hmm. uh, in reflection, mm -hmm. but uh, also then questioning, as Steve said, your environment, the things, the factors that are outside, and the factors that were within, within you, but then also moving towards growth and growth outside of the box, yes, mm -hmm. outside of this box, or outside of this particular linear circle, and then continuing on that journey of circular. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe Amalia, if you want to share quick. I know you're not done. I know you're not done, but maybe you can share with your cat. Uh, <laughs> 
many people and with uh, some ideas only just uh, I observe it. But right now I just I just change them and then so well, actually then I should use all the possible uh, possible methodology or tools to make change in my organization and my personal. So actually. It, it was that I just only, oh, this is great that I, uh, I can learn, uh, I just learn and then observe, but then uh, how then I can, uh, how then uh, some tools and methodology uh, I can replicate and use in, yeah, apply in my organization, my community, and me, myself. And what is the next thing you are going to do, first thing? Uh, the first thing that I will, uh, I'm going to do is just like, uh, Choose which one is appropriate to mine. Uh, actually, I just want to develop the kind of like a development program. So, yeah, uh, what uh, what I'm uh, gonna gonna do first is just like uh, filtering which one that is useful for us. Because uh, as I said, that lots of uh, works to do yeah. for me yeah. in my yeah, and then like the the winner, I, uh, like the middle, I I, I draw this one. It's kind of like moral burden. No, no, yeah. It's hard for me then, like uh, yesterday or like last night. Oh, it's hard for me then. Uh, I I just wear this one and uh, I need then yeah the many activity that I should do with this kind of middle. So it just not uh, stop in uh, last night, but this is start, uh, just starting for the next one. So you, you have to be birth. You know, yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's right. Uh, this is not finalized. But, uh, we had nice discussions yesterday after it was about. Uh, because we are, we are doing, doing in our program, we are doing consultation and then we are developing tools and methods uh, by ourselves. And, uh, for me personally, uh, I'm kind of a creative person and I tend to do things just once and then it's done and it's time for next thing or next version. And, <clears throat> Uh, no, normal way of thinking is that when you've done something, created something, and you productize it, and then you start to sell it, and, and so on. But we start to think about if, if we do something and it's already done, so why not to give it for free? Because then you can learn more, and others can utilize it. It gives you so much back, and by that learning and by, by all the history you are able to create the next big thing to make it free for, for the next next version and so on so so that could create a lot of energy and positive thinking and some kind of open source approach to, to the whole thing that we are doing and, and because of what, what that is creating I think the new things could be done with the clients every time so the clients are paying for things that we are doing once and then we give them out. And it's, it's okay for the clients. I love that, Akana. I come back to that because you know I've been uh, propagating to do the change journey map uh, open source for a year <laughs> now. I'll take your word. <laughs> Great. Okay, folks. I'd say I'll, um, I'll get Steve in again. Let me see whether I master the technology. Just a second. A mute here. Hi, Holger. Can you hear me? You need to unmute. Can you uh, hear me? Wait, I, I can't hear you. Can you unmute? Is that better? Yeah. So. Okay. Okay, your turn again. I'll mute my microphone. I'd All say right. let's go. Let's go for another uh, 10, 15 minutes, uh, 10 minutes, and then wrap up. 
Okay. okay, all right. I just want to also go through the model very quickly before we start, but I just wanted to, to reflect on some of the words and some of the stories I heard while you were going around there. First of all, uh, somebody was talking about thinking. A couple of people mentioned the concept of thinking. And what I find quite inter interesting is unpacking the definition of thinking. How do you define thinking? Uh, to me, it's got a lot to do with storytelling in one's own mind to oneself. I mean, you're literally talking to yourself in your own head. I mean, at least this is the definition which I've come to understand. What is thinking? It's telling stories to yourself. Um, also, somebody had uh, a couple of people had the question marks all over their timelines, and that's interesting because. Uh, the question is how we create knowledge. All knowledge comes from questions. So anyone who's got question marks on their timeline, you can look forward to creating knowledge through the questions you ask. Also, the, the metaphors used over there, a path, a road, a way forward. You know, we're, it's, it's almost stuck in three-dimensional space. What about the sky above? What about the earth below? There's all sorts of ways our stories could proceed without using the traditional metho um, uh, metaphor of the path or the road. Um, also, um, the use of the word I, I find very interesting as well. I and me and us and you, you know, first person pronoun. Um, do you know that in China, uh, the first person pronoun, if you use the word I or me, is considered to be rude, yeah? Uh, it's not the individual may have been one of the West's greatest inventions. And the reason we believe there is su such a thing as an individual, or me, myself, is separate from you, is the fact we have language for it. Uh, if we didn't have the language, we'd all be one thing and we'd all be telling the same story, probably. Uh, also, another thing to reflect on quickly, uh, do you think differently about someone once you've heard new information about them? Once they've told you something about themselves and they've shown you a timeline and they've spoken, they've used a couple of words to describe what's waiting for them in the future, do you start thinking of them in a different way once having received different information? And uh, you probably will say yes, because that's the basis on which we form our assumptions of people, you know, how, how, how they talk, what they talk about what they talk about when they talk about themselves and about the other and so on and so forth. This is how we construct our understanding or the model we have for all the relationships which we have. So after a while when you've modeled, or your, when your brain, mind, nervous system has modeled the world around you and you have a model, a very fixed model of, for example, your significant other, people might say things like, I know what she's going to say next. Have, have you ever heard that phrase being used? So. Uh, the story is really important, and more particularly if you're involved in change management, how you story the change which you're engaged in is vitally important. The story you tell about your own relationship to the change is probably the thing which needs to be changed. So you story the, the work ahead, what needs to be done in order to change this thing, what needs to happen in order that we have a sense of hope or that people trust each other more in the working environment or we have better teamwork. What kind of stories need to be told in order for those things to happen? And I think one of the things which has to happen is that the stories which you tell have to exemplify uh, the kind of things which you want. <clears throat> so it's talking about the things which you want to experience and creating a, uh, a precedent through that. So, yeah, that's just basically some of the uh, notes which I picked up. But think about it. Uh, uh, think about the stories you tell and think about how they're formed. Now, Holger, can we get back to the presentation? Because I'd like to do the model before, if we've got 10 minutes to, before we wrap up, I just want to present that model very quickly. So, shall I share my desktop? Well, Steve, the easiest... Oh, I shall I share it, Holger? No, I sh show it on my, my desktop. You just tell me which slide uh, to present, okay? Okay, go, 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 to, go to the first slide over there. And then you can move to the second. Okay, second is on. Yeah, okay, you can, I see. You can see, but they can right, see. So, yeah, I can see it perfectly. All right, so what we have over here is a, I've called it the form of forms of ancient collective memory. 
is there a bit of feedback there, Holger, or can you hear me? Uh, no, there's no feedback here. Do you have a strong feedback? I've got quite strong feedback from over here. I'm getting an echo. Okay, then then better share it your. Sounds like okay. Is... Sh share your share your screen. Share your screen, and I mute our microphone here. Okay. Okay. Uh, wait. Google Hangout. Share. All right. So maybe you can see that. Can you hear me? Okay, Holger. Holger. Holger, kannst du mich hören? Ja, okay, fantastisch. Ich sehe das. All right, so let me go up over here. Forms of ancient collective memory. So one of the oldest things on the planet are rocks and stones. Uh, they're the basis of what we've built, uh, and they're probably one of the, as I say, the, the oldest thing around. You know, the uh, human structures don't last very long, but they are rocks which date. Uh, we've got rocks in the garden. We're in Joburg. We, we've got rocks in the garden which are literally 250 million years old, um, and they've, they will be, no matter what has happened in that 250 million times, those rocks are still going to be around somewhere. So. Uh, the way collective memory, shared memory, is formed is through architecture, buildings, uh, rock art, uh, people who tattoo their bodies, song and dance, recitation, and poetry and stone memorials. So sto uh, stone and rock has got a great amount, of, uh, a huge longevity. Um, and in Africa, people used to mark stone circles uh, to mark places of significance. This would be one of them over here. And we talk about the Isivivani model, which we use, is based on this Zulu proverb, this idea to make a personal contribution to a great common task, to throw your stone upon the pile or monument. So the idea over here is that everyone contributes to a shared vision of the future. And this is really important in organizational change management specifically, but the same ideas apply to personal change management. Uh, you need to create a motivating vision or story of the future. All the vision resolves into a story ultimately, doesn't it? Um, the stones are contributed to by different people over time. So what you've got over here is a construction that we add to and say what we will be doing in time to come, in days, weeks, months, and years to come. And here are some of the ideas of what it's used for. Um, it's designed to manifest a dream. It's a model or game that everyone can understand and it's for individuals and teams, and I'll describe the entire thing for you over here. Um, you use it for developing accountability, creating shared vision, stimulating knowledge production and sharing, change management, service delivery improvement, team building, all of the buzzwords which are used in organizational uh, work, I suppose. Yeah. These are the benefits of active participative memory building. In other words, we get everyone involved in this process. Uh, you start to learn about people you work with, you hear their stories, you appreciate them in different ways, you share your vision of the past, the good bits as well as the not so nice bits because believe it or not, all organizations have got a dark side and that has to be explored and brought out into the light. Um, shared building of memory because memory is active, it has to be actively created, it has to be actively built and a sense of continuity into the future. And here's some way, this is the ways which people would have used this, you know, to train and prepare for war was one of the big things which Zulu, Zulu culture used to use Isivivani for, to describe strategy, to describe wh whose roles were going to be played, who would play those roles, and so on and so forth, or to identify with the cause. So the way stones were used was that stones are permanent, uh, different stones have different sizes and hardness and oftentimes in the ritual people would literally pick up a stone and spit on it and before they placed it. So for example I would say I commit to doing this in the future and I spit on the stone and I put it onto the monument in a particular part of the monument in front of everyone else and once I've done such a public commitment it's very very difficult if not impossible for me to step back from it. And this is one of the reasons why if you ever run this model, you might find that some people in the organization you speak to who are required to make a public announcement of their commitment to a particular project, 
may commit in public, but relatively shortly thereafter they will resign. They can't stay in the organization because you've created what psychologists call cognitive dissonance. You can't say one thing and not believe it and end up doing another. Accountability shaped your beliefs. All persons from all backgrounds can take part. So let me just go to this thing over here. Uh, how does it work? It's a knowledge production tool which has been revived for the modern world. It generates knowledge using structured questions. Answers to these structured questions are contributed by participants who are motivated to be part of the solution. And information generated in the Isivivania forms a plan of action that also acts as feedback to participants. So here are some games which we were speaking about earlier. Uh, this is a partial list of games. There's many, many different games, but these are all, all games which will be familiar to each one of you. The economy is a game. War is a game. Spirituality is certainly a game. Religion, government, medicine, psychiatry, law. In fact, there was a definition of psychiatry which was around the idea of psychiatry as a medical game that prevents the patient from realizing that they exist in a game environment. So psychiatry prevents to hide, uh, works to hide you from the idea that you're actually involved in a game because seeing it as a game makes it much easier and better to engage. Law, sport, technology, relationships, spirit, all of these are games. And I think all of these, all of us are involved in one or more of these games, aren't we? So here we go. We're going to now describe what a game is. And I'm going to start over here. I don't know if my cursor is uh, visible to you. But all games have got these elements in them. Every single game that you play, whether you're somebody's son, somebody's lover, somebody's daughter, somebody's significant other, uh, somebody's employee, someone's superior, someone's subordinate, those are all games. And as I said to you earlier, we play on average around about 35 to 45, 50 games simultaneously. So let's have a look at what a game is. It, first of all, it's got something called a central point over here, which is an organizing theme. Or you could put a vision over there. Um, and really what we ask you, and uh, this could be maybe used as a final exercise, is to name your game. Give your game a name. What is the name of your game? Is it trying to take over the world? Is it uh, world domination, being a good father? having fun, uh, you know, all these kind of things are, are all worthwhile games to play. Um, being very extraordinarily rich or trying out poverty as a game, because poverty is also a game. So name the game is the first area, that central point. Then we go out into the east, and by the way, this model has got lots of similarities with North American Medicine Wheel, and very great similarities with uh, African uh, traditional uh, religions, uh, spirituality, which are also games, of course, and uh, also with game theory itself. So a game is defined as a socially se uh, constructed sequence of action, and all games have got goals. All games are played for a reason, in other words. All games have got their own language and stories and metaphors. All games have got their own resources to play the game. What do you need? All games have got their own unique style. Like Bayern Munich plays it very differently from Barcelona, if you want to be trivial and talk about soccer, zum Beispiel. Yeah? Uh, all games have got their own values. Somebody mentioned this word as well. Uh, rules. All games have got rules. All games have got roles. And then finally, all games have got rituals. And if you notice that they are bi-directional arrows moving between the organizing principle and the name of the game to these component parts. Because what we're looking at over here is something which is a living system. If you change the rules, just change one rule in the game. Let's say you're playing uh, soccer and you change one rule and you say, right, it's okay to pick up the ball with your hands and run around with it. Can you see the entire game changes? So this relates to a set of systemic relationships. A change in one of these aspects creates a change in another aspect in ways which are somehow sometimes unforeseen. We oftentimes can't see the changes um, which will happen as a result of that unless we have something called a story which is the overriding framework for this game. It all, it, the game exists to serve the requirements of a story. So. We start in the east, 
at goals and we move in a clockwise direction and we engage knowledge production questions like very simple ones would be what are the goals of this organization um, what are we doing this for yeah what specific language do we use um, what words what stories what do we talk about in the organization what are resources we need to play this game well what is the style we have what are the values which we have? What are the things which we truly have to believe in and be committed to in order to play the game? What are the rules of the game? Everyone, I think, understands those, although in organizations the rules of the game are often uh, mystical. Uh, almost finally, the roles in the game. What do we need? Do we need a high priest? Do we need a managing director? Do we need a delivery guide? Do we need a cook? Do we need a computer programmer? Do we need a... Uh, technology specialist, what are the roles necessary to play the game? And then finally, the rituals, which is one of the things we're doing right now as a kind of a ritual. Step out of the story, step out of the game, look at the game from above with the eagle vision, with helicopter view, see it for what it is, make changes to these various things. I mean, is there language you shouldn't be using anymore? Is there language which is not congruent with your goal? Um, what are the things you really believe in? Uh, what are the resources you have? I mean, you could see Holger, for example, as a resource provider because he provides knowledge to you. Uh, what is the style, for example? That was a bit of an ad for Holger there, by the way. Eh? What is the style with which you play the game? Can you change the style? Who else is playing the game which you're playing? What style do they use? Uh, what and, and so on and so forth. So, knowledge production questions associated with this game and the way we use this in change management describe it in two sentences first of all we get people to describe their game as it has been in the past and they will talk about the bad language and the way people speak about each other and the things so that we talk about the world as it used to be and then we say now design the game cooperatively in the way you would like it to be. What would your ideal perfect game be like? And then they work on it participatively. And when you show those two models up next to each other, you can immediately see the change that has to be made. The difference between the old world and the new world represent what needs to be changed. So that's really where we are with the uh, with game theory, Holger. So that's all it in a nutshell. It can be taught in about five minutes, and there are, as I say, questions which you can construct yourself. And it's very simple what the questions are: who, what, when, where, how, and why, and why not. Yeah, are the seven questions the only seven questions you can possibly ask? So think about questions for each of these elements of the game. For example, what rituals do we have? in order to reflect upon the game. How do we step out of this? How do we get away from it? How do we see it from another perspective? And then when we rejoin it again, how do we make sure that it's a more interesting, rewarding, fulfilling, profitable, exciting, fun game than it used to be? Because we can do this at any time. So, I'm sorry. Yes, sorry? No, I, I, I thought that was your final word, but you, you're still... Uh, okay, no, 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 Holger, no problem. You can go to the final word. Uh, what do I have to do? Here? Sorry? Okay, there we are. Back again. I'm back again, Holger. Okay. So, do we want to give a final round of questions to participants, if there are any? And then we need to close. Sure, okay. Okay. Kaspar. I don't have a question. I just found very inspiring. Thank you, Steve. Kaspar says very inspiring. He says thank you, Steve. Vielen Dank, Kaspar. Um, keep on yes, the presentation will be uh, on our internal uh, part of the website. Uh, it's okay, yeah, Steve? Mm, sure, of course. Sir. Yeah, sure. Yeah, Everything in one or two weeks, all the presentations will be there. Okay, so I'd, I'd say I, I found it very inspiring also, and thanks for bearing with us with all the technology glitches and, and with <laughs> all the little bit of improvisation, but I mean, hey, this is Britain Change Days. Um, uh, I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, Steve, I think it was worth the experiment. I enjoyed it a lot, and uh, let's do something okay. like that, that again.
Thank you so yeah, much. That sounds super. That sounds super. And I did ask you this morning. <laughs> we'll get get another applause in a moment. But you wanted to ask something. Yeah, I did ask you if I should shave this morning, and you said no. So I am fully bearded. I would have shaved if I was working uh, with important clients like you are. Okay. <laughs> that, that that made it very very charming. I found. <laughs> so so thank you, Stephen. I'd say another round of applause. Thank you. Have have a, have a great day in in Joburg, and I hope to see you right. soon again. All right. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Olga. Thank Olga. you. Bye-bye. Cheers. -bye. Uh,